dusk isn't when you rest as the Amazon burns, it's when the day cools enough to give firefighters a chance. Everything we see in a bumpy hour's drive to nowhere turned to ashes in the last four days. This is how. A wall that marches across the bush and into the trees when it can. That feels a bit like the end of the world, doesn't it? And when flames rage like this, the firefighters actually have to pull back. And there's nothing they can do, really, until the wind dies down. Destruction that overshadows an entire branch of our species here. The Tenyarim are an indigenous community, a thousand strong, who say they legally own nearly a million hectares nearby. The next generation will have a darker future, he says. Since this president came to power, these things are happening a lot more. President Jair Bolsonaro is keen to bring what he calls progress to the Amazon, even pushing to let these areas be commercially farmed for the first time. The raging fires, all of which here have burned since he pledged to send 43,000 troops, clear land for farming too. The sun rises again on a little bit less of this marvel. The Tenyarim didn't want to be part of our world, but now it wants part of them. All around are signs of what's fueling the inferno. Land cleared for cattle, so we can eat more beef, logging and deforestation to enable crops like soy to grow line the busy roads. The firefighters that tackle the blaze here are three hours drive from the nearest village. This is the land we flew over four days before, but the devastation is more final from the ground. Fires do occur naturally in the brush, like Bolsonaro says. But it was startling how nearly every policeman, firefighter or official we spoke to said very many are caused deliberately. To clear land, to farm, to alleviate poverty or just make the rich richer. Yet they don't have the water here to put the fire out, only stop its spread. Damage limitation only with the most basic tools on the front line of this global environmental crisis. Nick Payton Walsh, CNN, the Amazon, Brazil. President Trump forced to respond to concerns that he tweeted to the world a classified satellite image. The image, a high resolution picture of a failed rocket launch in Iran taken by what appears to have been an intelligence community satellite. The president was asked about the image and where it was obtained late today. Here was his response. I just wish Iran well. They had a big problem. And we had a photo, and I released it, which I have the absolute right to do. And we'll see what happens. You'll have to figure that one out yourself. But we'll see what happens. They had a, a big mishap. It's unfortunate. And uh, so Iran, uh, as you probably know, they were going to set off a big missile, and it didn't work out too well. Had nothing to do with us. Out from now, Democratic Congressman Ruben Gallego. He sits on the House Armed Services Committee. He's a veteran himself. Congressman, thanks for taking the time tonight. Thank you, Jim. So let's begin with this. The president tweets out a, a picture, appears to be taken from a, a U.S. surveillance satellite. Those images are, by their nature, classified. Uh, the president claims an absolute right to declassify anything, which is, of course, true. That said, at what cost? What capabilities will the president have revealed to Iran and the world here by tweeting this photo out? Look, I don't know. Uh, and what, what we should be asking is, what is the end goal of this? And what is Iran's uh, reaction going to be to our actions? And how does that actually further the interests of the United States? It doesn't. This president is doing foreign policy by tweets. He has this mean girl policy when it comes to dealing with our enemies and with our allies. And it's just not the, you know, becoming of the president of the United States. What do you think his, and I know this is difficult to do, but what could be the possible benefit of denying something that the U.S. was not accused of, it wasn't accused of being involved uh, in this failed missile launch. What is the president, is he trying to send a message to them? 
Look, you're trying to find logic in what I believe is illogical actions of this president. I'm not going to try to go down that wormhole. It's impossible. I think we have to re recognize that this president does not quite understand where he is in terms of the world uh, order when it comes to the great power competition. Uh, we've had previous presidents that un really understood what, what we had to do. And the one thing when it comes to you know uh, power struggles in this world and trying to exert power is he needs to understand power whispers and weakness screams. And right now, uh, I think he's screaming and it really shows that we are isolated from our allies and are not in a very good negotiating position when it comes to Iran. One of the most important political events of the presidential election cycle, but Iowa now has a problem. It's trying to figure out how to get more people to vote when they cannot physically make it to a caucus event. So, so Iowa introduced virtual caucuses, a way to vote by telephone. Problem is, DNC is worried that hackers could tamper with that system. So sources telling us that the committee is about to say no to virtual caucuses. Let's discuss now. Joining me now, CNN senior political writer and analyst Harry Enton. Good morning. So Good morning. I mean, here's the thing. Like the, the thing about Iowa, right is, right, is how in person these events are. They get in a room, they listen to the candidates, they state their preference. This was an attempt to expand that right. more. Correct. But now it's running into problems. Well, now it's running into problems, right? Mm -hmm. Iowa caucuses have historically had low voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Obviously, after the 2016 campaign, where they're trying to bring more people in the process, basically the DNC said, hey, you can't have the system anymore. You got to be able to bring more people in the process. They came up with this idea of virtual caucusing via phone. And as you mentioned, that seemed like it might be open to some hackers. And now all of a sudden, Iowa is going to have to come up with a new plan to potentially sort of allay the concerns from the DNC that they're not allowing enough people right. into the process. They think Ebola comes from forested areas like these ones that you're looking at now. Uh, pathogens living inside of animals that somehow get into humans. And it's so scary because Ebola is a swift, efficient, and very bloody killer. In fact, in some cases, nine out of 10 people who become infected uh, actually die from this. It can take anywhere between two and 21 days for someone to start to get sick after they've been exposed. That's called the incubation period. And during that time, they can travel. They can travel around the country or even between countries. That's the concern. But here's, here's a little bit of good news, and that is that you're really not contagious. You're not gonna spread the virus to other people until you're sick yourself. That's when the virus is in your bodily fluids and you're gonna actually be able to spread it. But when you're sick, you're down. You're unlikely to be moving around. You're unlikely to be getting on a plane. But even after you've recovered, in some cases, you can still transmit the disease for a period of time after that for up to six weeks. The symptoms here can often start off looking like the flu. You get a headache, uh, people have fever, they start to feel unwell, tired, but after that it gets uh, unpretty. Uh, people actually start to develop significant diarrhea, uh, they may start to vomit, but what really um, is, is a hallmark of this is that it becomes bloody. The, the body starts to be unable to clot and as a result you see bleeding on the outside, but it's the bleeding on the inside that's the most concerning and it can often cause death. It's a difficult thing to test for, and that's part of the problem. In the beginning of outbreaks like this, nobody knows what's happening, and that's when people become careless. That's when healthcare workers start to get infected, and that's how something like this starts to spread. Here's a very important number, 42. 42 days, that's two incubation periods. If you get to 42 days with no new cases, that's when people will say, okay, this outbreak is over. They got to scour the entire country, the surrounding areas, and make sure there are no new cases, and then it's time to pack it up.